Ahead on CBN News Watch, the vice president sends a warning to North Korea. Hear his response to the country's nuclear ambitions. Plus, women lost on average about 15 pounds. They dropped their blood sugar by 21 points. Hormone reset. We're breaking down this weight loss diet plan just in time for summer. And sharing the good news. See how believers are spreading the gospel in this predominantly Muslim country. And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Vice President Mike Pence is in South Korea with a clear and tough message. America has had enough of its nuclear program and threats against the world from North Korea. Dale Hurd has the story. Vice President Pence began his 10-day trip to Asia by going straight to the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea to deliver a very blunt message to the North. The era of strategic patience is over. And he put North Korea on notice that neither the United States nor South Korea would tolerate further missile and nuclear tests. We will meet any use of conventional or nuclear weapons with an overwhelming and effective response. Pence's four-nation trip is intended to reassure America's allies and to show North Korea U.S. resolve. Some believe China could defuse the situation if it wanted to. China is the key. China is the key. They can stop this if they want to because of their control over the North Korean economy. And by the way, I would point out, and I know this will come up later on, but there are artillery on the border between North and South Korea that can reach Seoul. Mm -hmm. And we can't take them all out, but China can shut them down. But if China is unable to deal with North Korea, the United States and our allies will. And I think there's an international consensus now, including including uh, the Chinese and the Chinese leadership, that this is a situation that just can't continue. A North Korean missile test over the weekend failed in spectacular fashion. U.S. commanders say a medium-range ballistic missile blew up almost immediately after launch with the world watching, humiliating North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on the weekend celebration of his grandfather's birthday. Now some are asking if a U.S. cyber attack could have brought the missile down. There's a very strong belief that the Americans, through cyber methods, uh, have been successful on several occasions in interrupting uh, these sort of tests and making them fail. While the White House is using tough rhetoric against North Korea, a White House official says it will exhaust all non-military means to stop the North, including rolling out new sanctions before going to the military option. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Police in several states are searching for the gunman who shot and killed a 74-year-old man as he was walking home from the grocery store. He also posted that random shooting live on his Facebook page. It happened in Cleveland, Ohio, and police are urging residents in surrounding states to be on alert for 37-year-old Steve Stevens. In a separate video, Stevens claimed he killed more than a dozen other people, but police have not confirmed any other deaths. The FBI is assisting in this investigation. Severe weather swept through the country over the weekend. Tornadoes touched down in Nebraska and Iowa Saturday. And in Florida, a state of emergency was declared because of wildfires. Florida's governor says the state hasn't seen wildfires in this, this intent since 2011. The Florida Forestry Service says there are still 110 active fires covering more than 20,000 acres. The two fires needing the most attention are located in the central Florida region. In the Philippines, a growing number of churches are speaking out against their president's violent war on drugs. The Catholic Church has issued a rare pastoral letter condemning President Duterte's brutal methods. Some churches say his approach is fueling a culture of death. Lucille Toulousan reports now from Manila. On the 700 Club Asia program in Manila, Pastor Emil Ibanez painfully described the horrific condition of his son's body, who was victimized in an extrajudicial killing. A wire was tied around his neck, duct tape covered his face, his hands tied at his back, and there was a very big slash in his neck. It was so big. That was when I broke down. Why did they treat my son like an animal? Pastor Ibanez admits his son AJ was a drug user, but says he quit drugs and became a police informant just weeks before his death. 
AJ is among 8,000 people who have died since Philippine President Duterte began his war on drugs seven months ago. Most of the alleged drug users and pushers were denied due process. A creeping culture of impunity in the society has prompted the Catholic Church to issue a rare pastoral letter condemning the rising death toll. Catholic leaders called the government's drug war approach a reign of terror aimed largely at the poor. And the Catholic Church, of course, believing in the, in the gift of life of each and every Filipino, directly confronts the incident happening now. How to speak and how to, how to, to get out of the fear that is, supposed, that is being planted because of what's happening in the country. Linda fears for her life. She says five of her drug-dealing friends surrendered to authorities but were still killed. She says poor people like them should also be given a chance to change and have a new life. Poverty is one of the main reasons why these men and women are resorting to selling drugs as their source of income. And this is why the church and human rights groups are calling out to the government to resort to more dignified means of solving the drug problem, which is providing basic needs such as education and livelihood programs. Friends in the police and military are helping Pastor Ibanez solve his son's case. The pastor believes God is using his son's death as a wake-up call to all Filipinos that we should repent as a nation and come together to put a stop to the extrajudicial killings because this kind of evil only begets evil. What has happened to my son has inspired me to be more active in the ministry that teaches values formation to policemen who in turn teach values to students. Let's give a chance to the pushers and, and the users because we believe that everybody can change and that is the same thing that we believe that the president can do. That's what we have been praying for, that President Duterte really changed the way he's running the drug war. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Manila. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump host the annual Easter egg roll today at the White House. And over the weekend, they celebrated Easter at church. They attended services at the Church of Bethesda by the Sea in Palm Beach. His two youngest children, Barron and Tiffany, were also on hand. In his weekly radio address, the president echoed what he said in a speech Friday looking forward to Easter. He called Easter a holy day of reverence and worship and a sacred time that fills the spirit of our nation with the faith of our people. Operation Blessing is on the ground in Egypt, helping survivors of the Palm Sunday terror attacks. Staff and volunteers visited many of the victims of the St. George's Cathedral bombing who are still hospitalized. They delivered Easter flowers, gifts for the children, and joined priests in prayer for them. Operation Blessing is also providing food for 12 of the neediest families and looking for ways to help with some of the medical bills. The ministry also visited others and helped the persecuted Christians in the region. If you are looking to shed the pounds and trim the inches off your waistline, we've got some good news for you. All you have to do is hit the reset button. We'll show you how coming up. When it comes to losing weight, the body can make it easier for men than women. One physician says hormone imbalances put women at a disadvantage. But as Lori Johnson shows us, women can hit a hormone reset button and shed those unwanted pounds. After years of frustration, Lori Mazzone found a way to reclaim her high school figure. It helped her lose 11 pounds in just three weeks, followed by another seven. And she's not done. I lost four inches off my waist. Four inches in a month is unbelievable. I had not seen that kind of result in anything that I've done. Lori balanced her hormones under the direction of gynecologist Sarah Gottfried, who lost 25 pounds when she first tried it on herself. I started to share it with women in my practice, and the results were amazing. So women lost on average about 15 pounds, they dropped their blood sugar by 21 points. They lost four inches off their waist. We now have had 5,000 people go through this program. 
If one or more of seven key hormones is out of whack, forget about losing weight. But the good news is we can balance them with our fork. Specific foods can disrupt hormone levels. That can be fixed by avoiding the disruptive food for at least three days. In her book, The Hormone Reset Diet, Dr. Gottfried lays out a 21-day plan for seven weight-related hormones. It was gradual. It wasn't like a shock to my system. It wasn't like, okay, now you're off of all these foods at once, and it wasn't overwhelming. It was very... It was done in small little bits and pieces. Starting with red meat and alcohol, which can raise estrogen. Estrogen is what makes us feminine. It gives us breasts and hips. But when it's out of whack, when it's too high relative to progesterone, it's going to make you have weight loss resistance. You're not going to be able to lose weight no matter what. There are substitutes. When I would come home at night, I would get a wine glass and I would just fill it with seltzer and apple cider vinegar. I felt like I was drinking wine. The next three days, add fruit to the off-limits list to reset leptin. It's the satiety hormone, and that means it controls your hunger. Then give up caffeine, which disrupts cortisol. Cortisol is the main stress hormone. And when it's too high, it grows this muffin top. It just gives you belly fat that you can't get rid of. So once I've come off the caffeine, I was sleeping like a baby. Thyroid levels that are too high or too low can cause problems. Some of the common symptoms are thinning hair, weight gain, typically 10, 20 pounds, fatigue, depression. Eliminate grains to reset your thyroid. I grew up in an Italian family and they serve you like a half a pound of pasta. So like, oh, I was dying. How am I gonna do that? She did it by eating pasta substitutes like spaghetti squash or shirataki noodles. Next, avoid sweets to balance insulin. The sugar cravings were completely gone after four days, and I was really addicted to sugar. Abstain from milk products to reset your growth hormone. Dairy, I thought, would be hard for me because I like cheese so much, but I replaced it with hummus and I was fine. I didn't even miss it. Finally, avoid environmental toxins like plastic and certain cosmetics to balance testosterone. The average woman puts on about 515 synthetic chemicals every day on her skin. After you've reset your hormones, you don't necessarily have to avoid these things forever. Every three days, add one back and see how your body responds because everyone's different. And then you feel like a blank canvas. And you're like, you've gotten rid of all these foods and you feel so great. And then you get to bring them back and see what happens. And that's kind of interesting. When Lori resumed eating red meat, there was no change, so it's still on the menu. Dairy, however, brought a different result. She gained five pounds in just three days, a clear sign to stay away. I felt like I was um, doing a science project on myself. That was just the beginning. I missed my caffeine, I thought. So I had a cup of coffee, and that night I didn't sleep, and that was it. I just never had it again. So for women, hormones often dictate whether the body will burn fat or hold on to it. By replacing disruptive foods with healthy substitutions, we gain another weapon in the battle of the bulge. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And to learn more about the Hormone Reset Diet and where you can find the book, you can visit our website. Of course, that is cbnnews.com. Up next, we're going to take you to the largest evangelical church in Azerbaijan, where the majority of members are converts from Islam, including the pastor. See how they're spreading the gospel in a country of 9 million, mostly Muslim people, after this. Fifteen countries made up the Soviet Union until its collapse in 1991. One of them was the Republic of Azerbaijan. It is an overwhelmingly Muslim country, and practicing any other faith there often comes with a price. George Thomas traveled to the capital city of Baku for a closer look at what life is like for the country's small number of Christians. Judging from these scenes, it may surprise you that this place was under Soviet occupation for 70 years. 
Slightly smaller than Maine, Azerbaijan is the 93rd largest country in the world. Its location on the western edge of the Caspian Sea gives it strategic prominence. Iran flanks its southern border, Turkey lies to the west, Russia to the north. The capital city Baku is a thriving modern metropolis, thanks largely to the country's oil wealth. At one time, Azerbaijan produced more than half of the world's oil supply. Now, 26 years after gaining independence, the government is trying to shed its communist past in exchange for closer ties with the West. Azerbaijan is home to roughly about 9 million people. The majority of them are Muslim. No one knows for sure the exact numbers, but the estimates are that only 10,000 are evangelical Christians. I was the first Azeri person to accept Christ. In 1991, shortly after the Soviet collapse, Sari Mirzoyev became the first Azeri Muslim to convert to Christianity. Nobody understood why I did this, but as I saw God at work in my life, I realized that everyone around me was spiritually dead. He accepted Christ while attending a Russian congregation. At the time, there wasn't a single church for ethnic Azeri people. All the believers that I knew were Russian. In 1995, Mirzoyev says God gave him a prophetic word that Azeri Muslims would come to Christ as a result of his testimony. The Lord said that, even though the church at that time was made up of mostly Russian people, soon it would be filled with Azeri people, and the Lord would do it through me. 22 years later, he leads the largest Azeri evangelical church in the country. The majority of those in attendance are Muslim converts. Sometimes we have as many as 30 to 40 people who accept Christ as their personal savior in a single service. Establishing this church hasn't been easy. While the constitution allows for religious freedom, people of faith, particularly Christians and other missionaries who routinely engage in evangelism, face some form of harassment and intimidation. Mirzoyev says religious laws passed in recent years have made it more difficult to register a church, print Christian literature, and openly proselytize. Alan Bedov works with a network of unregistered house churches outside the capital city. It wouldn't be possible for anyone to effectively share the gospel without God's wisdom and help of the Holy Spirit. He says in the countryside, sharing one's faith can lead to fines or imprisonment. Preaching the gospel here is never easy. One evening, CBN News joined a secret gathering of young Azeri believers. We've masked faces to protect their identities. Hafiz is part of an outreach called Schools Without Walls that focuses on reaching Muslim families. Muslims often notice that we live joyful lives, and they wonder where our joy comes from. We tell them that we are Christians, and by seeing how our lives have been changed, Muslims can see the gospel. Ali, another convert, uses the School Without Walls program to also minister to young people searching for meaning in life. He says the home setting makes it a little easier to talk about faith. It's convenient and an easy way to study the Bible. Young people can talk face to face and ask each other questions, all in a safe environment. And being able to read the Bible in the native Azeri language has done much to expand the growth of the church here. Before, people could not even find the Bible, but now they have the Holy Scriptures in their hands. Gulshan Husseinova runs the country's only Christian publishing company. In 1995, the government gave her permission to print Christian literature. We started by translating the Bible so people could have God's Word in their own language. From there, we moved to producing books for children and various other Christian literature. Back in the capital city, Pastor Mirzoyev's congregation faces constant surveillance. The church has been shut down in the past and he's been arrested numerous times. Our path is challenging, but we overcome through Christ, who loves us. We are committed to praying for our president and our country. And in a predominantly Muslim country where the evangelical Christian population numbers about 10,000, Mirzoyev is believing God for his nation. We want to see all 9 million Azeri people to believe and come to know Christ. This is our dream.
George Thomas, CBN News, Baku, Azerbaijan. Beautiful place. Let's indeed pray that all nine million come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's now time for your Monday motivation, and I pray this thought will bless you and motivate you through whatever Monday madness you may encounter. It is time to see the power in the pull. There is something pulling on you. Stop and think about it for a moment. What's pulling you could very well be what God is drawing you to see. There is power in the pull. After all, I think a pull is a lot better than a push. Stay with us. That's going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com or reach out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Make this a marvelous Monday.